So I went into work one day and I was like, look, I want to quit my job to cycle to China, but I'm telling you now, you can come with me or I'll see you in a year and a half. I'm Jade, I'm a cyclist from Yorkshire in the UK, uh, and I just really, really love cycling. But I only got into it when I was maybe 18, 19, and as a child, I hated it. Uh, so I've had a pretty big, <laughs> big change in uh, lifestyle since becoming an adult, because uh, now it's all I do. <laughs> That's great. How did, how did, yeah, go ahead and uh, like expand on that introduction. Um... You know, how did you get into bikepacking? What what was kind of like the transition to get you from hating it to loving it to actually going and doing this massive trip that we hinted on? Uh, so when I first started getting into cycling, I basically saw other people riding fixed gear bikes and thought, that looks really cool. Uh, I'm going to get myself into that and got a fixed gear bike and moved up to Yorkshire where there are hills because I'm from Cambridge, which is completely flat and quite boring. And I realized that I love riding bikes and I love riding uphill. Um, so initially I was just riding fixed gear all the time. Uh, and I became friends with a really cool group of people. And um, one of them, my best friend Meg wanted to go to the, to on holiday on her bike. And I was like, okay, not really thought about this before, but yeah, that could be quite good fun. Um, so we strapped all our stuff onto bikes and went to Belgium and spent a week cycling around and realized that we both like hills too much to go to places that are flat um and it just became our thing and every year we picked somewhere new um did some amazing cycling in the alps and just yeah this was bikepacking but there wasn't really it wasn't known as bikepacking at the time because it wasn't really a thing back then uh, in 2020 yeah 2012 um and it all just sort of spiralled from there. I started doing more and more riding. I got a gravel bike. I got a mountain bike. I got a road bike that I hated. Um, and yeah, I just spent, I started to spend every holiday uh, in Europe cycling somewhere and was loving it. So in 2017, I decided that I wanted to cycle to China. And I didn't really, there wasn't sort of a reason for this. I just sort of picked China as somewhere that might be quite cool to cycle to um and yeah I managed to convince my boyfriend at the time that he should come with me and that we should both quit our jobs um, and we did it and I spent 16 months cycling across Europe and into Central Asia um and then I did a bit of flying around did a couple of other countries and then cycled back from Istanbul back home and then when I came home, um, I wanted to keep up with the miles that I was doing. So I was, yeah, we would, instead of riding, you know, 50 miles a day, I was started riding hundreds and hundreds of miles at the weekend because I was working full time again. Um, and this sort of transitioned into ultra distance racing, which is now uh, what I spend all my time doing. <laughs> That's great. Uh, when you when you did that first trip with your friend, like what type of gear were you strapped on your bike? Because I, I assume you hadn't really towed much around at that point. Was it just like hodgepodge bags and everything? Yeah, so we were on fixed gear bikes, which uh, don't really have, like there wasn't a way of putting panniers on my bike or anything like that. So it was, I think my first trip, I just had a little tiny backpack um, and we always booked places to stay, so we didn't have to carry camping stuff. Just sort of a change of clothes okay. and toiletries and tools and stuff things like that. Um, and my friend Meg's partner uh, had a company that makes bags for bikes, and he started making these prototype uh, saddle bags, bike packing bags. Um, we, we started ha having those to sort of to try them out and because we were doing these trips that we needed bags for but you couldn't I mean at the time it was very hard to find anything suitable on the market it was just panniers um and that was sort of it uh so yeah we went very lightweight and then as I got more into off-roading stuff like you sort of have to get into camping for it because you're in these amazing remote places where there's not a hotel you know every every hundred uh, miles or so um, but luckily everyone else started getting into it around that time. So there was a lot more on offer. Um, 
that you could buy for the bags and for kit. It's it's really interesting that you you keep saying that this wasn't really a thing in in 2012. Like when I'm when I'm doing research for this episode, I see that there's there's a whole website called Bikepacking, and it's got these like these glorious statistics on all these different routes you can do and all these different events. And uh, yeah, it's also interesting that when I searched for bikepacking. I immediately saw a lot of stuff in the UK and I don't know if that means that there's more bike packers in the UK than there are the rest of the world. But, uh, it, it's just like interesting that you're saying that this is like blooming or, or starting to come up within the last decade. And, uh, now you have, when you look at your bike, you have all this dedicated gear, these dedicated saddlebags that mount on your bike perfectly for you to ride through. Um, is that like an accurate depiction of all of it? Like, how in your mind how has this become more popular in your area or around the world yeah i think in the last like decade or so it's just massively massively become this huge thing and i think maybe covid had a bit of something to do with it because people were at home on the internet i think wishing they were out there adventuring and then post covid i mean that a lot of people got into cycling post covid um and yeah it's it's definitely really taken off like there's tons of different brands now all the big sort of big cycling uh brands and kit shops and stuff do really basic bike packing bags now um and you can get i mean some of the <laughs> they might not be great but you can get the kit you need for an easy overnighter for really cheap now and it's no longer this niche thing. Um, and I think there's people have done a really good job in recent years of making films and making content about the racing that's going on. And it's there's a massive boom. Like in the last couple of years, there's all these new races. It used to be, you know, there's these big races that have been going on for maybe a decade. They're sort of the, the big ones that everyone knows about. And, yeah, the last couple of summers, it's like there's too many races now. I've got this huge list of all these things I want to do and it's just you don't have the time to do them all and they're all at you know the same time of year and um, if you're looking at ones in Europe it's all the summer so yeah it's definitely huge now um and I'm interested to see where it goes from here and if more and more people get into it or if it's going to taper off a bit or yeah it's interesting and it's cool to be involved with it in this sort of transition stage of it being super niche to being something that you know a lot of a lot more people know about and are giving a go yeah and it, it does seem like it's it's pretty unique i mean any type of camping truck camping backpacking i mean you're just you're just kind of getting out in nature to to do so but now you have these actual events where you're solo I think I, I don't think you ever travel with a team. You're solo supported. You're just trying to get through the loop, through the the course in a time period. But you're actually camping overnight and stuff like that. It's it's pretty unique compared to any other event or race that I can think of. Yeah, I think so. um, there's a lot on the self supported thing with the racing, which I guess for a lot of other sports it's less. Uh, less doable like you can't ask people to carry all their food and water while running for a week straight because right. it's just not possible because you can do the bigger distances um but yeah the self-sufficient thing is very sort of big at the moment people are really into it uh did you did you have a camping background before you started going from you know staying at airbnbs and hotels and stuff and then actually living off the bike doing overnighters camping and everything yeah, so I camped loads as a child and I absolutely hated okay. it. I was that, that kid at the campsite, like kicking up a huge temper tantrum and being like, I'm going to sleep in the car because it's raining, <laughs> which is mad because now most weekends I'm sleeping outside completely by choice. <laughs> um, so I had sort of the knowledge, like I had the confidence to do it. Um, but yeah, when I first started bikepacking, because we had such limited uh way of carrying things and because it's nice to have a nice holiday and stay somewhere and be able to shower um we did a lot more sort of hotel uh trips but yeah as i did as i got more into off-road um 
you sort of limited with your options so the camping becomes more and more uh, worthwhile like it's worth carrying all your stuff if you know you've got multiple days where you're not going to hit any villages or or anything so i didn't find that that's awesome too nerve-wracking. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, i guess we can dive right into your your big 16th month long trip how like how did that come up how did the idea spur um what went into preparing for this and actually taking the plunge and quitting your job yeah so i've i think i must have read quite a few books uh people that you know quit their jobs and cycle around the world and you you read these things and you think that sounds amazing but you always think oh it's not you know maybe one day maybe i'll do it one day and i just kept thinking about how good it would be to just you know, do this bike packing holiday that I was doing, but it just didn't end. So instead of after a week or 10 days having to go back home, I was just thinking how nice it would be to just keep riding, keep riding, keep riding. Um, so I was working a very nice but not particularly well-paid or fulfilling job at the time. Um, and I just thought if I'm going to, you know, I was young, I didn't really have anything tying me down. I was like, if I'm going to do it, now's the time to do it. Um, and then I started telling people that I was going to cycle to China. And I didn't, I don't know if I really believed that I was actually going to do it still, but I started telling people that, you know, one day I was going to cycle all the way to China. Um, and then I thought about it more and more and more. And then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have to do it. Because if I don't do it, I'm never going to actually do it. <laughs> So I went into work one day and I was like, look, I want to quit my job to cycle to China, but I'm telling you now, and it's probably going to be in about six months, eight months time. So I gave them like a really big notice period. And then I just started telling people I was doing it. Um, and then I said to my boyfriend at the time, I'm going to go and do this thing. Do you want to come with me? And he was like, oh, I don't know. I don't really fancy it. <laughs> <laughs> After, you know, we talked about it more and I was sort of very much like, well, I'm going, you can come with me or I'll see you in a year and a half, whatever's fine with me. Uh, and luckily, because he's a bike mechanic, he decided in the end he was going to also quit his job and come with me. Um, and yeah, it, so it just sort of happened. <laughs> Did you like, so at that point he decided to do it, you it's approaching the date when you're actually going to leave. Like what, what are you doing to prep for this? Are you doing anything unique or is this just like a normal, uh, you know, four or five day trip and you just have to worry about refueling along the way? Yeah. So I obviously had a lot of kit already from doing the holidays. Um, and I felt like I sort of knew what I was doing cause I'd been doing, you know, there's not really any difference between going cycling with all the stuff that you need for a week and going for a year because you can only carry a certain amount of stuff anyway. Um, so there's, there's not, there's a few things you might take extra that you wouldn't take for a short trip, especially with going somewhere remote. Like we had to buy like a water filter and we got like a special stove that runs on petrol. Um, but most of the stuff is exactly the same stuff that I would take for a long weekend. Um, so yeah, I didn't really do anything special. I definitely didn't do any training because I was just like, we're good now and we're riding for such a long time. Like, I'll get fit as we go. Um, I mean, I was riding at the at the weekends and I was commuting at that time. But yeah, I didn't train for it. Um, we did one little shakedown ride where we got up a, a group of friends together and we all rode to sort of somewhere nearby and camped out that night and tried out the new tent kind of thing. But yeah, it was just a lot of buying things and then getting packed up and going. <laughs> that's awesome. That, that's something that I haven't had a lot of experience with because we'll do truck camping or, or like pop-up. We have a pop-up trailer that we'll bring and we're always prepping and bringing what we need for the weekend to get through it. And it's I've never done a real trip where I'm like dependent on resupplies or like you know these these unknowns uh i think that's awesome it's it's something that i haven't done so it's a little out of my element but i love that people do that and i like how how easy you made it sound or how unfearful you were about this um 
did you have a, a path in mind? I think you mentioned in the pre-call that you couldn't actually get into China. Um, but did you know that at this point or like, did you know how you were going to get there? No. So what we had planned was we were going to fly to Lisbon because we decided that setting off uh, in March from the UK would probably be really wet and cold. So we were like, right, let's fly to Portugal and we'll go to the most, um, there's a point on the coast just near Lisbon that's the most uh, westerly point of mainland Europe. So there's, I had this big idea that I was going to cycle from the sea uh, on the west coast, the furthest west point you can get to, all the way over to the east coast of China. Um, and of course, we were supposed to get visas en route to China, um, but we there were loads of issues with the visas. You can't get them outside your home country now. So we sort of left mm. it too late and then we couldn't get a Chinese visa. Um, so we didn't end up going to China, but that's fine. Um, but yeah, we didn't really have a sort of strict plan. We had sort of areas we wanted to ride through, roads that we'd heard about that were really nice, um, places we wanted to visit. Uh, and I knew I wanted to do the Pamir Highway. And to do the Pamir Highway, you've got to get to Central Asia sort of at the start of summer so that you're not up um, at altitude. Uh, it's sort of mid-September when the weather starts getting bad. Um, but every day we just looked at the map and decided where we felt we could get to the next day, you know, where might be a good campsite or, oh, that's a town where we can get dinner and then we can go find somewhere to sleep afterwards. Um, so, yeah, we just kept it really, really loose and unplanned um which was really good because you meet loads of people and everyone tells you oh you have to go here you know you have to go to this road or you have to go look at this thing that's nearby um and anytime someone told us that we just did it and it was amazing and it was much better than if we'd you know i could have sat at home for months before going planning out looking at google maps being like right i'll do this road and then we'll go left here um, and it would probably be rubbish when you actually get there and do it in person. But if you just follow what people tell you and they live locally, they know what they're talking about. So I think it was the best way to do it. That's awesome. Did you, like, how often did you stay in, like, your tent versus the cities? Because I know Europe gets pretty dense there. You could probably go through a lot of different cities if if you were interested, but maybe you were trying to avoid that altogether. I don't know. Yeah, we quickly realised that like riding for a city just isn't that fun, um, <laughs> and that we were more interested in just being out sort of in the wild um, than seeing sort of touristy things. So there wasn't really any point for going through cities unless we had to. Uh, so yeah, we did loads and loads of camping, um, and we also there's a website called Warm Showers, which is for connecting cycle tourists with hosts. So people go on there to say, I'm cycling through here, can anyone host me? And then other people are on there to say, any cyclist can come and stay with us for free. And we did that quite often if we had to stay like near a city or somewhere built up. And we stayed with some amazing people and had some really great experiences. Like people were so kind and they just take you into their home and it's like your family. Um, and yeah, so that was really cool. But yeah, if we weren't, doing a warm showers night we pretty much mostly camped unless the weather was really awful and then we treat ourselves to a hotel sometimes are all the this warm showers website is that all cyclists so immediately there's something in common with these people that you're staying with yeah so when you stay with people it was either that they had done a big trip recently like in previous years and were now home wanting to host or quite a few times, actually, we stayed with uh, older people, older couples who had a son or a daughter who was currently cycling around the world. And they had obviously been telling them about, you know, oh, we're staying with all these warm showers people. And the parents had decided that they were going to get on and host other people that were doing the same thing. So that was really nice. Um, but yeah, we just met some amazing people doing it. It always, it always fascinates me how, how like, all your fears and you know scares, your anxieties go away when you are relying on a stranger to to like provide for you. And you know these people are inviting strangers in, into their house, so that's that's scary in itself. But when you when you you know it's all around a hobby or a common goal or 
you know, in your case, biking, biking across Europe, it, it just goes away. You can like immediately have something to talk about immediately have something to relate to. And that seems to just expand into all of your conversation. Uh, it's still terrifying to just have a complete stranger stay with you, but it, it's amazing. And it sounds like more times than not, it, it works out and it makes for just like a really, really good story or a really good time. Um, yeah, I'm sure you, you agree with most of what I just said. It's just something that I love and I've, I've never heard of that website before. Yeah. Uh, we had some great experiences, um, especially as you head more into Central Asia I guess there's more of like hospitality culture there and people would just be flagging us down constantly. Come in, come in, have a cup of tea. And you'd go into these houses and you'd sit there for a few hours and you'd drink tea and you'd eat some biscuits and you wouldn't be able to properly talk because they would have very limited English. And sadly, I only speak English, really rubbish. Um, but you would manage to converse and make sort of explain what you were doing. And I think people just found you know, it's so strange that you were traveling by bike that that sort of breaks the barrier down because they want to know where you're going and what you're doing and why you've chosen to cycle in this really remote area that we know where tourists don't really go. Um, but yeah, the, the best part about it is meeting people, really. Yeah, so I want to I wanna pull on two things before we dive into the culture aspect of it. But as you're going from the east side all the way to the west side uh or the sorry the west side all the way to the east side um are you riding on roads sidewalks paths like what what is the the breakdown of the different roads you're going on and how did that change as you made it over towards china so we were mainly riding on the road but obviously as you go further east um often the road become less and less paved or less and less maintained so we started doing more and more off-roading and i mean well it's not off-roading because you are on a road but more and more gravel more and more sort of mixed surface riding um and by the time we got sort of in properly in central asia we realized that we actually really enjoyed the off-road stuff so when we went to new zealand um we actually did quite a lot of like off-road trails and then when we came back to Istanbul and cycled home from Istanbul, we started to yeah we started to choose to do a lot less road and a lot more off road, um just because we it was what we enjoyed more. That's great, yeah. So so when you got out of Europe, you know how how did how did a lot of these unknowns pop up as you went into these you know these Asian cultures? Because now you're I don't know if you're having to do exchange or I don't know if you're having to exchange currencies the whole way through Europe. Um, you're going to have to be, you're going to do that a lot more when you get to Asia. And now I'm sure over time and I'm sure, I'm sure there's many times where you can even talk to the people that you're around. So can you just maybe go into the culture shocks that you experienced throughout this whole trip? Yeah, so doing it uh, west to east and being on the bike when you're moving quite slowly through places is actually really useful because things change relatively slowly. So you don't ever get this culture shock of like, oh, it's suddenly massively different. But there were definitely border crossings where you would know, like things would be noticeably different once you got across the border. Um, but yeah, like this is again one of the reasons why I like it and why it's so interesting to do is because you get to see all these different cultures and you get to meet people that are different from you and are having like, different life experiences than you are. Um, luckily, if you're a native English speaker, pretty much everyone in the world now has a bit of English as a second language. So we didn't find it too difficult. Um, I did end up doing a lot of like, gesturing with my hands <laughs> the more like the further uh, east that we went to sort of communicate with people but we yeah you just pick up a few words in each country sort of please thank you food uh, you know and you sort of you can make yourself understood um but yeah sometimes we'd spend ages talking to people and you wouldn't actually 
neither of you could speak the same language, but you can make you can still have a conversation. <laughs> oh man, that's I can't even fathom that fully. Like I feel like we've had I've had broken conversations with people who speak Spanish, but you know, my wife and I we we know a little bit of Spanish, so even then we're we're able to talk quite a bit. What year did you do this trip in? Uh, 2018, 2019. Okay, so before all the mayhem, was there any was there any moments in time where you're crossing uh, borders? And I don't know, like, what, what is the border crossing experience like the whole time? Did you just have to flash a passport? Did you even have to do that in some areas? I'm looking at some of the countries that you probably had to cross through, and I'm also wondering if there was any, like, sketchy areas or did you ever feel like you were in danger or in a like a lower lower class area that was uncomfortable or anything yeah so going for europe um obviously this was like we'd only uh the uk is now no longer part of the european union but we'd only just left so there wasn't the visa issues that they now have um so and going through Europe, uh, a lot of the times you cross the border and you don't even realise until you get to a town because there's nothing to, you know, if you're on a tiny little back road, there's nothing to say that it's a border. You're just suddenly, right. suddenly you realise a few miles later. Um, but when we got to, I think, crossing into Azerbaijan was the first time where we had a proper border with uh, border guards that had guns. And as someone from the UK, where we don't have any guns. That was quite... Uh, and I, I felt very scared going through that border, even though I knew I did not have anything you weren't allowed to have. I still felt quite nervous about it. Um, but it was fine. And yeah, you just get used to it. But it's quite good on the bike because you can just sort of cycle to the front of the queue most of the time and they just sort of wave you through. Um, I don't think we ever got properly like had our bags searched or anything. So it was fine. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask how that changed being on a bike versus a car because you're probably you're probably amongst a bunch of cars as it is. So you look like an outsider immediately. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did have quite a funny. Um, we had to cross a border from Tajikistan into um, Kyrgyzstan, and it was this tiny little border post, really high up on the in the mountains, um, above altitude, and they didn't have a computer or anything. But we had our passports and we had our visas printed out and we went in and we showed, they, they made us all go in separately. So we went in separately, I showed them my stuff and they said, that's not you on your passport. And I said, yes, it is me. And they said, no, it's not you. And I said, yes, it is me. And we just went on like this for a while. But I was like, they didn't have a computer. They didn't have any way of looking anything up. So I, was, I just sort of kept saying it was me and then after about five minutes of this back and forth they decided it was fine i could go through but i don't really understand what what the, what the they thought was going to happen or you know what the any other outcome could have been but that was quite scary at the time but afterwards was just sort of baffling um and fine <laughs> they're trying to get you to crack so can you can you kind of explain where you went through in Asia? And I understand that you couldn't get your visa to go to China. So what did you kind of do towards the end of the trip? Yeah, so we went sort of direct across Europe um, and we, to, oh, I can't remember what the sea is called. Uh, we got a ferry across Black the... Sea. Black Sea. The, yeah, and then we did the Azerbaijan. Capizian Sea. Yes, and then we got this... Well, it's not really a ferry. It's like uh, a cargo ship that they allow some people on. Got that across the Caspian Sea, which was a really great experience because you have to turn up at the port and then you ask them when the next one is and they say maybe tomorrow. And then you sleep. You just put your tent up at the port and you just hang out there. Uh, and there were about eight of us, all cyclists from the UK, because with visa issues, that's sort of the way the cyclists go. If you've got a UK passport, and every day we'd say, is it going to be today? And they'd say, maybe, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. And then one day they would suddenly say, right, that's it. Everyone get on the boat and you'd go and get on the boat. Um, and you just have to deal with it. You just have to sit around uh, and experience it. And then, you know, we think we ended up... 
on the boat but not leaving the port for a while and then we went across um, and then we went into Kazakhstan cycled through Kazakhstan and cycled through a bit of Uzbekistan and some of uh, we got a train over some of it because again visa issues we only had five days uh, that we were allowed in the country then we went uh, to Tajikistan did the Pamir Highway Kyrgyzstan back into Kazakhstan and by this point we knew we didn't have our visas for China um, and we decided that we would we didn't want to go home <laughs> So the ha the plan had been we get to China, we go home. We got on to the border of China. We weren't going into China. Um, so we decided, where can we go next? You know, I don't want to go home. What can we do next? And we thought, it's sort of getting to winter. Let's go south. Let's go to New Zealand. Um, so we went to New Zealand, but we decided to go via Vietnam because we had to uh, do a changeover for the flights anyway. So we spent a month in Vietnam. And then we spent three months, their summer, but our winter in New Zealand. And then we uh, went to Taiwan, did a month in Taiwan, which was completely, uh, we didn't know, we didn't really know why. We just decided, yeah, Taiwan's probably going to be cool. Didn't know anything about it, but it turned out to be really, really great. And then we flew to Istanbul and then cycled Istanbul north back up to England and did, then did go home. <laughs> Man, that is so wild. Was there any, was, uh, like, what was the area that was the most of a culture shock? I feel like all the, the Astans, those are, like, countries that a lot of people don't even know of. So I feel like that had to have been a little bit of a culture shock compared to Europe and then in New Zealand and whatnot. Yeah, so Central Asia was very different, um, but it was quite doable, Um Vietnam, I think we found the biggest culture shock because the language barrier um, is very difficult, but also the written language barrier is incredibly difficult. So we uh, were quite rubbish and really struggled to even be able to tell, you know, what the sign for hotel was. Um, and people didn't seem to be particularly uh, up for giving a go at speaking English, whereas in Central Asia, people, you know, sometimes you'd start chatting to someone in a shop in Central Asia and they'd get their phone out and they'd ring their cousin's next door neighbor's mate who spoke, <laughs> apparently spoke English and they'd put them on the phone to you and you'd have this like translator. Um, but yeah, in Vietnam, I think maybe because they get more tourists, so a bit less like, they just didn't really care <laughs> as much. Um, so I think that was where we struggled the most uh, with the language barrier. And we, we had like one moment where we were trying to get this hotel room and we were really tired and we were talking, to, trying to talk to this guy and he just kept talking to us in Vietnamese really quickly. And we had no idea what he was saying. And we were just going, how much can we sleep here? Uh, like, and he, he, trying to put it on Google Translate and he just kept saying stuff to us in Vietnamese and writing down in Vietnamese. We just didn't, didn't know what was happening at all. And after about 25 minutes, we were just like, right, we're going to have to go. He's obviously not giving us a room and as soon as we turned around to leave he was like no 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 it's fine come in come in and like took us to the room and showed us it and told us the price so I don't know what he was trying to tell us before then um but yeah other than yeah Vietnam Vietnam and Taiwan was not as bad but still quite difficult but other than that everywhere was pretty much fine for the language barrier and then it was quite nice getting to New Zealand because it felt like being home and it was suddenly really easy. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about that. I mean, you got all the, like, Scottish Highlands and stuff like that. And, and I know New Zealand's got a lot of the, like, similar-looking terrain. That's that's an interesting parallel. Uh, I also, I, I've i never been to South South Asia or Southeast Asia. So, like, you, you saying that they're very accommodating or, or welcoming to to travelers i think that's that's like i'm keeping that in my head for the future um yeah i mean i think i said this in the the pre-call but i always like to leave time for for stories like is there any particular stories that come to mind as you're you're jutting across half the world um that fall into the high quality fun category or just just ones that you enjoy telling yeah so I guess high quality fun is like type two fun, right? So when you're you're not having a good time 
in the moment <laughs> and afterwards it's like this is excellent so glad this happened and so much of the trip was like that but the the best thing that bike packing has taught me really is that everything always passes so even if something does feel awful in the moment and you're really not enjoying yourself it's not going to be that long until suddenly everything's great again um so for example we were one in new zealand we were riding in this massive thunderstorm and hail lightning thunder everything is absolutely tipping it down and we were like desperately looking everywhere we could to try and find something to shelter under and we got to this little campground because they have these like free campsites um and the only thing that was in this campsite that was a shelter was a tiny little long drop toilet and the weather was so awful and we were so cold we were just like right we're just gonna have to go stand in this toilet and we stood in the toilet for maybe two hours as the storm raged on around us just in completely soaking wet head to toe all the like there was water coming in through the roof so we weren't even properly dry but we're just like this is better than you know getting hailed on or getting struck by lightning um and then after about two hours the rain stopped the sun came out and we were like okay this is great but we couldn't camp at the campsite because the ground was completely waterlogged like really really boggy um so we were like oh no we're gonna have to keep going and it was that was where we'd planned to camp for the night so we kept going down the road and about 10 minutes down the road we saw this sign and this little house and we went over and had a look and it turned out it was um like a hiker's hut so there was a sign up saying that the people that owned it came by at seven o'clock every night and it was just before seven um and then it was twenty dollars and you could stay in this little hiker's hut and they had a hot shower and little kitchenette and two beds and a little room and that was it and it was just amazing. It was like that was exactly what we needed at that moment in time. And we had no idea it was there. Um, and we we stopped there for the night and these lovely people came. We had a nice chat with them. We gave them the $20, got all our stuff dry, had a lovely night's sleep, had a hot shower. Um, and that's that's what it is. You're just constantly going between these sort of low moments where the weather's bad and the riding's hard and you're not having that much fun. But then, you know, before you know it, you're in the next moment and you're having the best time of your life and everything's amazing and it's great. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's such a good way to put it. And that, that's like, that's how it is too. Like, even if that, that, even if you didn't find that hut or that camper, the hiking hut, you know, you probably would still be laughing at at that rainstorm because you finished the trip and it's such a monumental accomplishment that you've done. Um, I think you said you had a few other stories, so feel free to just keep carrying on. Yeah, I've got, I mean, I've got tons and tons of stories about having a, you know, riding along, having a great time and then someone just stopping in a car and giving you something and it just completely turns your day around. Like, um, we did a lot of riding in really hot weather uh, in Central Asia. And, you know, you'd be riding on these huge main roads in really, really hot conditions and just feeling awful. Uh, and someone would stop. And we were on this big hill once and this, this car stopped ahead of us. And I thought, oh, that's weird. And these guys got out and they gave us each an ice cold Pepsi. And I nearly cried. <laughs> so I was just like, at that moment in time, that was the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, and you just, we stopped and we had a nice chat with them and we drank these Pepsis. And then it was just, yeah, had an amazing day after that. Because, and that was how it was like the whole way around. Like just constantly people were just stopping to give us stuff or to talk to us or to, you know, to check you're okay, offer you a lift. Um so yeah, even when it was bad, it was still really great. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Um, you, so you, you kind of hinted at this at the beginning, but you get back home and your trip's done. You start working again. You're kind of itching to keep riding. Like what did, how did that look? And how did that lead you into doing some of these more competitive events? Yeah, so when we were on tour, we probably, we averaged doing about 50 miles a day, which isn't a ton. Um, but when we got back from tour, like my body was just so up for riding every day. And 
I also realized I was just really happy all the time because I was riding every day and spending a lot of time outside and I didn't want to lose it but I did have to start working again because sadly you know you need money to live um so I'd started doing bigger and bigger rides at the weekend and I got to the point where I was doing sort of the same amount of miles that we'd been doing a week on tour just on my Saturday and Sunday and then I started doing more off-road stuff and started camping out and carrying you know sleeping kit to so I could do these really long rides and camp somewhere um and then I started doing stuff like I'd ride uh to my parents house which was uh 200 miles away and I'd do that in one go and I'd ride through the night to go see them and things like that and it all just it gradually built up so it didn't feel like I was being very strange it felt totally normal it was like the next sort of little step um and I had some friends that were doing the sort of the same riding I was doing and they started doing races and I'd not heard about this bike packing racing or ultra distance racing before but I, I sort of it it came in to my notice and I was like oh this is a thing and I didn't know it was a thing um and it was very similar to what I was doing at the weekend just for fun but people were doing it in a big group and there was this big community behind it um and I just thought oh that's so cool and maybe I could do that like I'm not the fastest but I'm pretty experienced now at the camping part and the carrying your stuff part um so yeah I had a few friends that started doing these races and I just felt like I was missing out a bit so I started doing them as well and now that's sort of the big thing I'm into and it's it's like being on tour but you just have to compress a really long big trip into a week or a weekend um and it's such an amazing community sort of vibe to it as well so it's like you get to do all these big adventure things but you can still have a normal life where you're working nine to five um, and you get to meet other people that are into it as well. So it's really cool. That's great. Can you, can you maybe go through some of the, the different events you've done and, and maybe go into how they stand out in your mind? Yeah. So I, um, I did a few like sort of smaller uh, ones that people won't have heard of probably around the UK um, before I got brave enough to enter um, Highland Trail, which was sort of one that had been on my radar for quite a while. Um, and I've done that Highland tra- Trail twice now, and I've done, uh, I did the Atlas Mountain Race, which is quite well known. Um, and I did that one as a pair with my friend. And I've done uh, Dale's Divide twice. And yeah, it's, they're all just really exciting. Um, and there's a really big sort of following now. So there's this thing that people do called dot watching. Uh, and there's all these people that don't race, that sit at home, they're really interested and follow along because uh, you have a little tracker. Um, and sometimes you'll just be cycling along and someone will just pop up and go, go on, Jade, you're doing really well. And it'll just be someone that's sort of following the race from home uh, that lives nearby the route and has come out to say hi to you. Uh, and, there's, yeah, it's just an amazing community of people that ride and also people that are interested in watching other people do these rides. Um, it's just really fun to be a part of. I I feel like as I've I've pulled apart some of these different events, that's typically how I find guests. I find an event that I think is cool, and I research people that have done it, and that's how I found you as the Highland Trail. Um, but they have such good GPS tracking and all these events events now and i could i could totally see the draw of just you know staring at this dot over a few days over a week whatever it is to see how these people are progressing and just i don't know make up your own story about why someone passed someone uh i've never heard it called dot watcher though so that's why i'm i'm smiling because that's that's pretty relatable and i i love it um yeah, you, you also mentioned that you there's an event you've done several times before. I think it's the Lakeland 200 that you you uh, are pretty proud of. You have the fastest known time for that. Yeah, well, I've got the women's winter fast, fastest known ah, time. Okay. Um, so not the overall fastest known time, sadly. But yeah, so this is uh, an independent time trial, which is sort of like racing because you've got the time pressure and the idea is to do it as fast as you can 
uh, from when you set off to when you finish and it's up to you if you sleep or not but there's no one else doing it at the same time as you um so with ITTs sort of the good part is you can pick whenever you want to do it so you can look at the weather and the conditions and you can pick the best time for doing it as fast as possible but the downside is there's no community vibe you're just out there by yourself mm -hmm. and it's quite hard it's harder to motivate yourself to go fast if there's no one to catch or no one that's catching you um but yeah so the Lakeland 200 is a mountain biking route in the Lake District uh 200k I think it's the hardest route uh, that I've ever done uh, on the mountain bike and also the best uh, I've done it three four times now um there's a list of about 30-ish people that have completed it in the 40-hour time cut off um and I'm I'm the only person that's done it more than twice I think and this is over 10 years so it's a very small list for how long it's been a thing um because it's it's very hard to do it in 40 hours there's a lot of carrying your bike over uh mountains uh, and not as much riding as a lot of people would like there to be um but yeah i love it and the guy that uh designed the route who also designs the highland trail route and organizes the race for highland trail he challenged me to do it four times in a year one in each season and that's what i'm currently uh doing this year so i've done winter and i've done spring and i'm going to do summer in two weekends time and then i'd do all uh do the autumn one once i get like later in the year I haven't decided when yet but yeah so i just love the route um i don't know if anyone else loves the route because most people do it once and that's it <laughs> i'm sort of in a fight with no one you, but through the i'd argue you're through the worst of it winter and uh winter and spring are brutal compared to summer and fall Although summer will be pretty hot, so I don't know. Uh, it, um, it's very difficult in the Lake District. So I did it last August, and it rained the entire weekend without stopping. Um, but when I did it, the two times I've done it in winter, the weather's been really, really good. And it's been dry, and the trail's been dry, so it's been quite fast riding. So, yeah, it can you don't know what you're going to get. Um, but it's, it's good to have a challenge. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, up until two years ago, there were no women on the list that had finished it in the 40 hours. And now there's about eight or nine of us um, because there's a group called the Steezy Collective that decided they were going to sort of make a big push about trying to get some women on this list because it was quite sad that there weren't any. Um, so they organised like a mass uh, finish for women to go and try and do it uh, on a couple of weekends couple of years ago and filmed it um so that sort of put it out there and got it on the radar for a lot of people so now yeah now we're getting there with a, a good representation of women uh, on the list which is nice nice but when did you first hear about the term fastest known time because i've heard it twice i've heard it from you and i've heard it from a, a hiker that i've had on the show before that i'd never heard about it uh is it is this something that's actually documented anywhere like how how do people track that term and, you know, compete against it? How do we yeah, even know so that you're not lying about it? Do you have to, like, document <laughs> your, do you have to GPS record it? Yeah. So, I mean, with the cycling now, most people have, like, a little computer that they record on. Um, but it's fastest known time, right? So if you put it out there that you've done it in whatever time, and no one says, well, I've done it quicker, then you've got the fastest known time. But it doesn't right. doesn't mean no one has done it any quicker. Um, but there is, uh, two years ago, I think, there someone set up a website tracking the fastest known times for off-road cycling in the UK. Um, and so there's a website and Instagram, and they sort of publicise, like it, you send them your route and you say, I think I've done the FKT for this, this special route. Um, here's my ride and they'll look at it and decide if you have or not and then put it out there but i think it's from running i think it's from ultra running and i think there's a website in america that tracks all the big routes um for ultra running and hiking that does the fkts but it's very niche and again i think covid sort of helped 
get more people onto it because people just wanted to do something but you couldn't do things with your friend so it was like right i'll go out and just try and ride this route as fast as i can and see if i can get the fkt but yeah it's pretty popular at the moment and um, lots of people are going out there and going for them that's uh that's some good insight because uh yeah that that's a term that keeps popping up and it's it's pretty cool um jade is there anything else you want to go through i feel like we covered a lot and i i'm I'm glad with everything we touched on, but if there's anything you want to pull apart, I'm I'm happy to stay on a little longer. And uh, no, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you so much for coming on. I I really loved hearing about your your trip across the world, and uh, I just think that's so so cool and so impressive. So I'm I'm glad I had you on. I hope you had a good time. I did, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I just. Uh... I would really recommend it to anyone that's thinking they might enjoy it one day. Just tell your job you're quitting and go. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the High Quality Fun Podcast. If you guys enjoyed this show, please give us a follow. And if you have a good story or just want to say hi, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram or YouTube. Thanks for listening.